Take your Bible, turn to the book of Genesis. If you would, please. I would appreciate it. Um, Chris Gunn and his family had to leave. They uh, have a situation going on. They have a daughter who is of legal age. And uh, apparently she did something she was not supposed to do. So they are going to go home and deal with it. And um, so I told Chris, asked us to pray for him and his family. I told him we would. Um, you know, we go through that. That's life. Um, my parents, when I reached 18 years old, they were not always happy about everything I did. Um, my first year of Bible college, I flunked chapel. All you have to do for chapel is show up. <laughs> and they kept attendance. And so, um, when we were in, um, Wyoming, uh, we had been driving all night and I fell asleep at the wheel and hit a car in front of us. It was an old beat up car. These guys were, they worked in the mines there. And um, back, that was back, before, that was 1985 before cell phones. So we drove down to a, a truck stop, which we were gonna stop at anyway and change drivers, which was only five miles down the road. But anyway, I was in the left lane, four lane highway, and I fell asleep and came over to the right lane and hit the car in front of us. Not hard, but enough to wake us all up, you know, because everybody was asleep in there. There was five of us in that van, and we were all asleep, including me. And, um, but what God did was he allowed me to hit that car to wake me up because the embankment on the side of that highway in the plains of Wyoming was at least 30 feet we able to roll that van, killed every one of us. There was no doubt in my mind. So we get down to the truck stop, and the highway patrolman, bless his heart, I don't know if he was Christian or Mormon or what, but I told him who we were, what we were doing. We were traveling, promoting the gospel. And uh, so he said, don't worry about their car. It's an old beat-up car. These guys drive it to the mines every day and work. These guys make good, good money. They've got a brand-new Ford F-150 sitting at home. He said, they're going to total it out. It's going to cost your insurance company 500 bucks. No big deal. And he said, I have to write you a ticket for something. So you say you were doing about 65. Well, back then it was 55. And he said, I'll get you for doing 65 and a 55. It's a $15 fine. And I went. He said, it's done. It's over with. So that was early that morning. We didn't stop until late that evening. We were in... Um, Nebraska, I think. So we got to the hotel and I called my parents. Mom, I just want you to know I'm okay. I said, we were in a wreck and we hit a car in front of us. I fell asleep at the wheel, but it could have rolled the van and killed us all. But I just want you to know we're all okay. She said, fine. Why did you flunk chapel? happened that way yeah she said your daddy oh yeah so anyway yeah we've all done some pretty stupid things in our youth amen i think it was mark twain or somebody like that that said why is youth wasted on the young yeah all right genesis chapter one did you bring a bible tonight i appreciate you being here appreciate you folks online means a lot to us it really does Genesis chapter 1 verse 3 this is where we left off last Sunday night and I'm not going to cover this because I already talked about it and I'm going to move on a little bit from it but just kind of give you the background of some of the verses we're going to look at tonight God said let there be light and there was light the focus is God's word and the relationship that it has to light this is the first occurrence in the scriptures of God speaking the first occurrence and when he speaks the first occurrence of his speech created light and that ought to that ought to just roll over your soul because God's word is 
light. Now, I'm one of these that I, I understand that it is metaphorical and symbolic, but I don't think it's limited to being merely symbolic. I think that there is, there has to be something related to the speech of God that scientifically, physically brings light. That's what I believe. And I know that light comes in two forms, particles and waves. That's something that we've discovered in the last few years. Particles, which are tiny bits of matter, light photons, they're called, bouncing off of objects and reaching our eyes. And that's what we see. When we see things in this world, we're seeing particles of light bouncing off of objects like shiny heads on men. Okay. Ron said, what are you looking at me for, huh? <laughs> Particles of light bouncing off of that, going into my eyes. And my eyes picking up on that. But it's God's word. The first time God speaks, light enters into his creation. I, I don't think I can talk on that enough. Because it's the, probably the deepest subject to understand. But it's the best subject to understand. Because God's word is light. The entrance of thy word gives light, David said. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. How can we be guided through this world if it wasn't for the light of God? And what I was preaching this morning is we want the light of God to go forth from us and from our lives literally to reach other people. People will see it, especially as if it gets darker in this world. You understand that, right? Not necessarily the daylight and the night. But the darkness of the sins of this world, I think people are going to see God's people shining better. The stars are up there in the sky right now, but we can't see them. Because the light, the sunlight is shining up there. When that sun goes down, then the stars appear. And that's what Paul said. You're going to shine as lights in the world. And so... If it gets darker outside, and I believe it's going to, and it already is, don't worry. That's our opportunity to shine. Amen. Father, bless the teaching of your word tonight. Give these people grace. Bless Brother Chris and his family as they travel. Give them safety. Bless their home. Father, all of us at some point have been or are or will be in a battle against our enemies, for our homes. And Father, it's a battle worth fighting. It's a battle worth fighting. And I pray to your God that you'd bless them. Bless all families tonight, Lord, that have or are now or will be fighting a battle for their home. Get rid of our enemies for us. Help us, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Now, uh, let's see here. Turn your Bible to, if, yeah, let's go this direction. Ephesians, then 1 Thessalonians. Turn to the New Testament and just kind of meander. It's Acts, Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. Then when you find that, step back, uh, go forward a little bit, actually. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians. So just kind of hold your place there in both those places. Ephesians 5 says this. I love the book of Ephesians and Galatians and Romans and Corinthians, Hebrews. Ephesians 5 verse 8. For you were sometimes darkness. Ye were. We were sometimes darkness. Paul walked in darkness. And Paul's first encounter with Christ, what did he see? Light. Light shining from heaven. And that light wasn't just a spotlight that God put on for Jesus for the effect. It was Jesus himself. Was that light. And it was so intense and so bright, Paul couldn't see. He had to be led to Damascus. And then finally the scales fell off his eyes. But ye were sometimes darkness. But now... 
are ye light in the Lord. Now notice how this sentence is structured. He did not say you were sometimes in darkness, but now are in light. He said ye were sometimes darkness. You were darkness itself, not just in it. You were darkness. But now you're not just in the light. You are light. If you are in the Lord, you are light to this world. Walk as children of light. Now he's going to double witness this. Look at verse 13. But all things... In fact, let's, let's read all this down to verse 13. Verse 9, For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of what? Darkness. Because remember, God separated the two. Once you're in, once you are in light and light, once you're there. Remember that parable that hide it under a bushel? No. I'm going to let it shine. That's what that means. Once you've been given light, why go back to darkness? Except some people, and I really believe this, some people, once they get in the light, they don't like what they see. And they turn back. What a shame. All things, uh, where was I? Verse um, 11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. So I'm not allowed, and I don't want to be, but as a minister, there are other churches in this community. But I cannot be part of the ministerial fellowship in this town. I cannot. Because I would be in fellowship with darkness. Because it would accept the Catholic Church, the ultra-liberal Methodist Church, that reaches out to the LBTQ, RAS, TLV crowd, or maybe the Mormons, when the Promise Keepers, you remember the Promise Keepers movement back in the 90s? Uh, it, was a, it was a man's group that swept through all the churches, and these men were going to these big conferences trying to get, you know, revived, trying to send revival to these men, and it started out as a pretty good idea until big money took it over, then it started including Roman Catholics and Mormons into that fellowship as equal partners in Christianity. And some men jumped out and they said, we can't be part of that, but a lot of people stayed. That's fellowship with darkness. We can't do that. Okay? So whatever organization, whatever group you're part of, if it's darkness, get out. Ask God to lead you out and He will. Have no fellowship with unfruitful work, works of darkness, rather reprove them, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things, how many things? All things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Whatever reveals it is light. And, and I'll even say it like this. Think of, think of Braille to those who are blind. To those who are blind, who put their fingers on a piece of paper with these raised dots on it, who scan those lines and read those, to them, that's light to them. Because it, it's words that gives them ideas. Words that they can't read with their eyes. They must read them with their fingers. But they are words nonetheless. And I like these big, I mean, these are huge, these big Bible. Whoever saw the book of Eli, that movie? That Bible he had was a braille Bible. He was totally blind in that movie. That book was light to him, even if he only could read it by his fingers. So anyway, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Now turn to 1 Thessalonians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians. <clears throat> Chapter 5, verse 3. For when they shall say peace and safety. Boy, wouldn't you like to know what that means? I think for now, we memorize it. When they shall say peace and safety. When they shall say peace and safety. When they shall say peace and safety. Because I believe at some point, they, whoever they are, are going to say peace and safety. Those two words. Or th probably three, peace and safety. But they're going to say those words. And when we hear them, we're going to know we know what time we're in. 
How would we know that? We are light. We are in the light. When they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child. They shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober. Sobriety and light go hand in hand. If you've ever had a hangover, what's the last thing in the world you want done? Turn the lights on. Don't turn the lights on. Drunkenness and darkness always go together. Drunk people want it dark. Bars are dark. And now, churches have turned, since they've turned into a theater atmosphere, they've turned the lights out. Literally turning the lights out. I was teaching this at a church in uh, Arkansas, and a, there was a visiting pastor there, and he came up to me after that, and he said, Brother Mike, he said, thank you for that. He said, I got a guy, in my ch he's a youth guy in our church, he said, I love him to death, but what he's wanting is to pull out all of our young people and go into the, the, the family facility that they have, like a big gymnasium, something like that, and have a church service there, turning out all the lights, except for what's on the stage, turn out all the lights in the building, except for what's on the stage. And he said, there was always something in my spirit that said, that ain't good, that's not right, don't let him do that. And he said, I see it now in the Bible. And I, and I said, that's just what I see. I see all these churches now turning into a theater, and all the lights are off. Okay? That's, that's, and that's why they have to, when, they, when they're going to change the church, have to get out of this building, because there's too much light in here, and they have to go to a building that deliberately does not have any lights in it. Or has very little lights in it. So he said, verse 9, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's us being in the light and children of the light. And it's because we are followers of God's word. What God said, we believe. Therefore, we have light in us. And I'm just, you know, you know I listen to a lot of science things. I like science. And I hear these guys talk about, you know, this right here proves that the earth is, you know, 15, you know, or 12 or 10 billion years old. And see this strata here, this was 65 million years ago and all this. And I hear all that stuff and you kind of go, well, you know, but then you remember the scripture. No, six days, 6,000 years ago. So I reject that and I believe what God said. In spite of whatever else they come up with, I'm believing what God said. Believe it, trust in it. Because after all, when things are going bad in your marriage or in your home or in your life, you do not call a scientist to help you. First Peter, very quickly, you are a chosen generation. First Peter 2, 9, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people. You are four things here. And God said four things when he made light. Let there be light. So God says, you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, holy nation, peculiar people. That you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. His light is marvelous. 2 Peter 1.19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Wherein you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. So here's what I believe. I believe right now we carry physically in our hands... A King James Bible. In heaven, we won't need it. Because the day will dawn and the day star will rise in our hearts. And, we, and the day star is the word and we won't need to read it out of a Bible anymore. We'll know it. We'll know it. Well, I look forward to that day. Amen. The, that, that, all that knowledge, Ron will tell us if Bigfoot's real or not. Amen. Then we'll know. We'll go. Well, look at there. There's a whole herd of them right there. See, we'll, we'll know these things. Amen. All right. Oh, look at Revelation 21. I, boy, I like this. Revelation 21. Whew. 
Several years ago, I ought to do this again. I'm going to ask God to let me do it. Several years ago, I, God laid on my heart a message about heaven from Revelation 21 and 22. And I want to tell you something. We can preach on hell a lot. We can talk about how dangerous life is and how you ought not sin and stay away from this stuff. Don't be part of that and all these do's and don'ts. But I'll tell you what, the glory rolls over a man's soul when he reads about heaven. When you read about the place that we're going to, where the darkness is not allowed there, it won't exist. No dark places, no dark days, no sadness, gloominess, no depression, no sickness, no pain. Revelation 21.10, he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And her light was likened to a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. This, you know, in jewelry stores, they put those diamonds there in a case and they have lights shining directly down on top of those diamonds. They don't, just, they don't just let room light do it. They have light specifically for those diamonds and those pearls and all that gold and everything like that. They want that to shine. And I want you to think about New Jerusalem. It is made, I believe, of light itself. Her light was likened to a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. I think it's made out of light. It's a city of light. It shines. It glows. City planners, cities all over the world, when they build new buildings, they want that. They put a lot of glass in these buildings now. Have you noticed that? A hundred years ago, they were brick and cement for the stability of it. But now we figured out that we can give the stability on the inside of the building and let the whole outside of it be glass. Why? Because it shines. And they want these beautiful, shiny cities gleaming in the sun. And all of that pales in comparison to what heaven is. Verse 23, the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. Now, I believe, according to scripture, that it's going to be there. Because God said the moon would endure forever. And the ordinances of the moon. So I believe it's going to be there. But what good is the moon? The moon lights up the night. Right? The moon lights up the night. In this city, there is no night. And no darkness. So we don't need it. It'll be there. We don't need it. For the glory, look at verse 23. The glory of God did lighten it. And the Lamb is the light thereof. Now, go back to Genesis 1. And read verse 3 again. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Now, at this time, the sun, the moon, and the stars have not been made. They've not been made. There's no sun. There's no moon. There's no stars. The source of the light... That God brought into this world to bring evening and morning and evening and morning until day four. The light that was there was Christ. He was in the beginning with God. Amen. So again, I focus on this is the very first time in your Bible God is recorded as speaking and look at there, it's in verse 3. And how many are there in the Godhead? Father, Word, Holy Ghost. There are three. So it's in verse 3, God said four words, let there be light, and there was light. Four more words. It's related to God's Word, which is Christ, who is the Son and the Son, both. S-O-N and S-U-N. He's both of them. And he was in the beginning with God. He was already there. Revelation 21, 24. The nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. The kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor unto it. Revelation 22, 5. There shall be no night there. And they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord giveth them light. And they shall reign forever and ever. I love it. All right. Now, day two. Or as Paul Harvey would say, page two. 
I miss Paul Harvey. I love to listen to Paul Harvey. Genesis chapter 1, verse 6. And God said, let there be a snow globe over the earth. Right? Is that what it says? No. God said, and I want to teach on this. Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Because remember, day one, you have the creation of the heaven and the earth, but the earth is void and without form. Darkness is upon the face of the deep. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So there's abundance of water. And so what God's going to do now is he's going to separate layers of water. He's going to separate them. So let, the, let it divide. The firmament is there to divide the waters from the waters. So it's a separation. And God made the firmament, verse 7, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. Now, if I look at numbers, which I always do, the number one is the number for beginning and the first things. Things that are important to God are always number one. Um, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The lamb that was brought in was to be a lamb of the first year. When you paid tithes, you were to pay tithes on what? The first fruits, not the last, not the leftovers. Well, I paid the bill, son, but now we don't have enough money to pay our tithes. You should have paid your tithes first. So that's legalism. No, that's honoring God. He gets the first of it and God will pay the rest of it. Doesn't matter how big it is. I, I think God's great in giving everybody the exact same amount, 10%. It's not higher for people that are rich like liberals do in this country. It's the same. So if you don't earn much, you don't have to pay much. But if you take in a lot, then you give a lot. It won't hurt you either way. Okay? So God, and so that's the number one. The number two is the number for division. God dividing things. We have two covenants, first and second coming of Christ. God speaketh once, yea, twice. So the number two is always the number for division. And that's what you have in verse six. Let it divide the waters from the waters. You have waters here and waters here. Division, second day. So let's look at this. Here's how Webster's Dictionary, if you get the Pure Bible Search software, there's a Webster, Donna's smart. If I had half of her brains, I'd probably be dangerous. But she embedded the 1828 Webster's Dictionary. Why the 1828? Because that was the English that matched the King James Bible. And the definitions that Webster used, he gives scripture because that was what everybody who spoke English back in that day was familiar with scripture. If you knew English, you knew the Bible. Okay? So here's what Webster said. The region of the air, the sky or heavens. In the scripture, the word denotes an expanse, a wide extent, for such is the signification of the Hebrew word coinciding with regio, region, or reach. The Hebrew word, Webster says, does not mean an, a glass dome. It means an, a region, an expanse area. The original, therefore, does not convey the sense of solidity, but of stretching and extension. And you can think whatever you want to think. I'm talking to people on camera. But some people a whole lot smarter than us, with a lot more expensive telescopes than us, measure stars. It's what they do for a living. And I don't think they're lying when they're saying this star was in this position 20 years ago and it's moved, according to our measurements, one millimeter, which spread out over 150 light years is a million miles. They're still expanding. Still getting bigger. And that's what that means. Stretching. 
God said he stretched the heavens out, made it big. The great arch or expanse over our heads in which are placed the atmosphere and the clouds in which the stars appear to be placed and are really seen. So maybe it was the idea of people seven, eight hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, that there was this dome over the earth, a hard dome, and God stuck little lights up there. And it's not very far away. But we, when we started looking through telescopes, we saw that that wasn't the case. It wasn't that way. You could tell there's distance built in there. You can tell it. So now in Genesis chapter 1, what Webster just said matches same chapter, verse 20. Because God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that they may fly above the earth in the, what kind of firmament? Open firmament of heaven. So that's God defining the word firmament. It's not a candy shell with a toy surprise in the middle of it. It's not this. not uh, a man that many of you may have read his books says he came out of the occult used to be in some very bad things in some bad places doing some very evil things Aleister Crowley type things it says a woman his bank teller told him he should pray for him and he not too long after that he got saved and for years, he went around exposing a lot of things. He, he wrote a book about his testimony and how God brought him out. And I appreciate that. But he's got in with some of these Hebrew roots people. And it's warped his brain. And I have written emails to him explaining to him that some things he had on his website were blatantly unscriptural. He took them down. And I told him, I, he said he believes the King James Bible. I told him I appreciated that. So I'm not going to mention the man's name. But now he's gone all flat earth. And he's saying that the King James Bible says it. He's not telling the truth. He's lying. And I don't like that. This is, this is not how the, how the universe is. It is open. It is expanded. It is stretched out. Okay? God said it was. So, that's the first firmament. So there's waters down here. Rivers, lakes, seas, and doggy puddles on your kitchen floor. Okay? And fish tanks. There's water down here. Then, God took the water and cut it in half. And he put water in the open firmament of the heaven. And it's, you go out there now, you see it. Clouds. And those clouds are huge. And the volume of water that's in clouds is absolutely stunning. How heavy. You know how heavy water is. It's like carrying gold. It is super heavy. And yet, God made it an expanse. The firmament that he built is called air pressure. When the air pressure is high, there's no clouds in the sky. Write that down. That rhymes. The air pressure is high. There are no clouds in the sky. When the air pressure is low, that's when the water flows. Write that down. I just made that up. And that's how it works. The firmament and how God divided everything is called air pressure. And I feel air pressure. In my bones, in my body, I feel air pressure. My wife will say, well, I'll look at her and I'll think she's mad at me. Say, no, I'm not mad at you. I got a headache. But it's that time I know I can make her mad at me, so I don't. But that's the open firmament, the expanse of the first heaven. And the clouds there are the waters that have been separated and divided from the waters down here. But then God's not done. That's the second heaven. I love that. Don't you? You know, I, I don't mind 
that taxpayer money went to build and put in space this telescope. I don't mind that. These pictures are absolutely stunning to me. This is how big your heaven is. All these dots right here. See them? Those are not stars. All these dots here. Can you see my dots up there on the screen? See all these little white dots? They're not stars. What are they? Galaxies. Not a Ford galaxy. These are individual clusters of billions of individual stars. See how many there are in these two pictures. Can you count them? So how many stars would there be in just this picture? And that represents about a half a millimeter of space from our vantage point. Multiply that by how much there actually is. And that's what you're going to see. And I do believe that we are in the center of all of it. Now I'm going to show you this. You see these little curls here? These curved lights? See this circle here? The news came out, they discovered a black hole. And what they, 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 they theorized what it would look like. Then they were able to, able to take a picture of one. And their theories were pretty close to what they actually saw. But these circles of light show us that there is a black hole in this area. Because the gravity, we know that gravity changes light. Okay? If you ever look above a fire and see how the heat ma makes the what's behind it wavy, okay? Heat and gravity alters light. We know that gravity can pull a strong magnet can pull the light and bend the light of a laser. We know that. So what this is called is called gravitational lensing. This circle that you see here, this blue circle here, there is actually behind this object here, there is a strong gravitational force, probably a black hole. And what you're seeing in this circle here is the light that is behind that black hole being bent out into a circle from our vantage point. If you were behind that black hole, you would see the stars behind it. But because that hole is there and the gravity is forcing the light out away from it, it takes it and bends it into a circle. I think that is cool. Because God made that. God paints a picture prettier than any man. And it's bigger too. His canvas is huge. Now look, turn to Psalm 19. This, I like, this is me. You got to let me be me every now and then. The heavens declare the glory of God. Not the accident of evolution. The heavens declare God is so powerful. He can make a gravitational black hole in space so strong that it bends light. That's how big God is. How many, Todd, how many black holes do you think there are in the universe? Countless. Trillions of them. Could be trillions of them everywhere. And yet God holds the whole universe in the span of his hand. That black hole does not affect God. It does not hinder him in any way. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament. What showeth his handiwork? The firmament does. Day unto day utter a speech. Night unto night showeth language. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. There's no place on the earth where you won't see day after day and night after night. Even in Antarctica, it just takes six months. They only get two days down there. Actually, they only get one day down there. Six months of light, six months of dark. Okay? And that's it. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. That universe. 
I believe that earth, let me get to, I have a graphic here, yeah. I believe the earth is at the center of God's creation. It's what I believe. And all these heavens, the first heaven, the second heaven, the third heaven where God is, no matter where you are on the earth, and the earth is round, no matter where you are on the earth, heaven's always up. So is the second heaven. So is the first heaven. It doesn't matter where you are on the earth, up is always up. Okay? And the earth is at the center of all of that. And what's below our feet is the basement, the pit, which is also at the center. There's not a hell sitting somewhere else in the universe. God's not going to transport the dead to some other planet, make them live there. It's under our feet on this world. Okay? So I, I am geocentric to the core because I believe the earth is at the center of the universe. Um, which is as the bridegroom coming out of his chamber rejoices that a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of heaven and his circuit under the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. So the firmament shows us the work and the power and the glory of God. And as God can divide water from water and separate the two. Has not God separated you from where you used to be and what you used to be? Amen. Praise you the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Um, what astronaut was it? It's the Apollo 8 mission. The first time going to the moon. And their object was to take the capsule to the moon, orbit it, to show that it could be done, and then use that orbit to kick them back toward the earth and land safely. It was Apollo 8. And I'm trying to think of what astronaut it was that as they rounded the backside of the moon and for the very first time saw the earth from the moon. He was going to read, he was, you know, you got to come up with something to say being the first human to see that viewpoint. And what he said was, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God, He's reading, quoting Genesis 1 from a King James Bible. Because this is still the 60s and there is no NIV. He's quoting it directly from the King James Bible. The heaven, he, this lost astronaut, recognizing the power of God's creation. Because he was able to see it first time ever from a different, and he's in the firmament of God's power, giving God the glory and the praise. Madeline Murray O'Hare went nuts over that. Okay? Um, I don't have time to get into this part of it here because it is important. So I want to spend a little time with that, and we'll do that uh, in a couple weeks, all right? But the main focus here is the light and the separation. God calls us, He's just like He separated light from darkness, and He separated the waters here from the waters here, God separates us from darkness. Our, our calling is not to remain here. Our calling and our goal is to be lifted up and separated, Jody, from this world. The waters that God put up there, that's us. God lifting us up and separating us from what's down here in this world. Which means we are to live high. Set your standards high, your goals high, your life high living high. Amen.